Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Matthew Hurth. I'm at the uh, Mayo Clinic in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, today, uh, here with me, I have uh, Dr. Christopher Kramer. Uh, he's a, a neurointensivist uh, from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and I've asked him to join us today uh, just to talk more about status epilepticus. Um, Dr. Kramer, there's been some guidelines that was, were set out by the Neurocritical Care Society, and I kind of just wanted to highlight those in the video today just to kind of discuss um, a little bit more about what is status epilepticus, um, why is this important, and um, I guess, and what the guidelines, how they help us uh, take care of this. So, Dr. Kramer, um, why don't we just uh, start off with just a simple question. Can you tell us what is status epilepticus? Oh, well, thanks for the introduction, uh, Dr. Hurth, and I think you picked a very important subject for us to be able to discuss today. Um, status epilepticus is defined as uh, having uh, either one very long seizure lasting greater than five minutes or a series of recurrent seizures um, where the patient doesn't come back to normal again over the course of about five minutes. Now traditionally uh, this definition was over a longer period of time either like a half an hour or ten minutes but these guidelines or in these guidelines uh, the publishers decided to shorten the duration um, and that was to be able to highlight the importance of being able to treat these uh, seizures early, number one. And number two, uh, studies have found that if patients are seizing for more than five minutes, um, they typically won't stop having seizures unless they get some help with some medications. Right, absolutely. And, and I know that in the clinic, you know, when I'm seeing patients, I usually tell them things like, well, most seizures last less than two minutes. So that I, I can understand why that five-minute, you know, guideline has been really set out there because um, well, th these are important. So um, the next question is, so uh, there are all sorts of different types of seizures that people have. Um, this is probably the, true also of status epilepticus, right? So what kind of different types of status do you see in the intensive care unit? That's another good question. So, uh, Dr. Hurt, the, the two main types that we see are what we call convulsive status epilepticus and non-convulsive status epilepticus. And the difference between those as far as how the patient looks is that in convulsive status epilepticus, the patient has um, uh, actual uh, convulsions or movements of the arms uh, and the legs and will be stiff. Is that tra traditional, like, kind of grand mal seizure or general exactly. kind of chronic, right? Right, exactly. Um, and so they're a lot easier to recognize because people can actually see them having a seizure, something that we all, or at least as healthcare providers, can recognize. Non-convulsive status epilepticus is a little bit more difficult. Sometimes this can manifest a lot more subtly. Um, and this is, can either be a primary thing where patients have this non-convulsive status epilepticus or they can start with the convulsions and then the convulsions stop but the patient's still having seizures up in the brain. So typical things that we see is, you know, again, the patient's having seizures electrographically, the brain is having seizures, but maybe the patient will just seem off to the family members, or they'll just seem confused, or they'll seem agitated. Um, sometimes they'll just seem like they're sleepy and really not do anything at all, and they're just you know, kind of laying there or they're acting funny. So, that's a lot more difficult to recognize than if somebody's, you know, actively having convulsions. Right, right. And and as we look at the guidelines, I mean, I think there were some very interesting um, aspects in there because they were talking about, well, I mean, yes, we have these different and they look different, but actually at the end they may mean also, um, I mean, suggest different outcomes too, right? Yeah, that's, that's very true. So the, the mortality, for example, of convulsive status epilepticus is about 20%. Uh, which is is pretty high. I mean, when you're saying that, I mean, the death rate, that's scary. That's very true. It's very scary. It's about one in every five patients, unfortunately, will die who has convulsive status epilepticus. But if that figure was scary, patients who have non-convulsive status epilepticus, um, about 60% of those patients um, can unfortunately die. Um, and so there is a significant difference between the two. Right, right. And the way you're describing the non-convulsive status epilepticus, I mean, that doesn't seem as obvious, right? Exactly. And so one of the main determinants of outcomes, at least in a few of the studies that have been published, is the duration of seizures. And so perhaps one of the reasons why patients with non-convulsive status epilepticus are more likely to die from the disease is that 
maybe perhaps it goes under-recognized. And it, it takes a lot more time to be able to control those seizures. Right, because, uh, I mean, as they kind of even say in, in some of the other aspects of neurology, I mean, time is brain. So the, the, the quicker we kind of get on top of these things, you know, potentially the easier sometimes we're able to treat and the less harm that, that can be done in, in the long run. Well, um, kind of getting back towards these guidelines that we've uh, been alluding to, um, I guess the other question I have for you, so the Neurocritical Care Society came out with these guidelines. Um, why is it important to have guidelines? Like, what is, why is this a big deal to have this kind of written down on paper? Well, it's, it's good to have at least a, a baseline set of knowledge for how to treat these patients. They've actually done some studies and found that, for example, uh, patients have a higher rate of mortality um, when they're not treated properly, and of course that makes sense. But, you know, this allows a framework uh, to tell physicians how do you treat these patients properly. Now, of course, medicine is always individualized to the particular patient. These guidelines kind of serve as a reference, and it's not individual for everybody. But, again, as I was saying, it's a nice framework for, for physicians to use to treat their patients and hopefully have better outcomes. That's great. Now, there have been a lot of different papers in the past uh, that have kind of suggested, well, this is how you should treat status, um, you know, do X, Y, and Z. Um, there's, there's quite a number of them that have come out from several different people. I mean, do, are these from the Neurocritical Care Society? You know, I'm sensing there's a little bit of a uh, difference in these than, than what's come out before. Well, that's, that's also a very good point. I think what's, what's I mean, old knowledge is, is good to be able to incorporate. I think what makes this set of guidelines particularly useful is that these were made by the people who are primarily treating these patients, and that would be patients, uh, or sorry, physicians who are neurointensivists, um, or patients who, or sorry, physicians who have specialized, specialization within epilepsy. And even a lot of the uh, physicians who are on the paper, not only are they neurointensivists, but they're also neurointensivists who specialize in epilepsy. So you've got the, the world's experts coming together to be able to create some kind of, kind of consensus on how to treat these people. Um, and on top of that, um, these, there's constantly been new renovations in terms of treatments for patients with epilepsy, and these, at least of 2011, um, are up to date with many of the newer seizure medications that have come out. Now, being 2015, it may be time for another revision of the guidelines, right. but at the same time, you know, it's the most uh, contemporary guidelines that we currently have. Right. Because some of these newer anti-epileptics, uh, which actually um, from the epilepsy.com website, you can go and look at all the different uh, seizure medications. There's several of them that have come out in IV form, mm -hmm. and, uh, and those are, are somewhat included in these um, guidelines here. Um, I guess the other point that as, as I was looking over things uh, to kind of look at is they actually, I mean, this was not, I mean, some of these things uh, are expert opinion because there's not a whole lot of data, but, but this, the, the, the medical, to, to emphasize this, the medical data was combed over to, to come up with these recommendations. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess the hope is that, um, you know, that physicians become familiarized with these guidelines so that, you know, all of us are basically treating things in the same way with the best evidence we have. Absolutely. But I completely agree with you. I think this, this is going to need constant revision as more and more things come out. So good. Um, all right. So um, I guess I'm going to say is, uh, I guess maybe we should leave, some, leave uh, the viewers with some take-home messages about status epilepticus. So, um, I guess I'll start with one, <laughs> and maybe we'll go back and forth. Um, that, uh, you know, if seizures are lasting longer than five minutes, that's when we really need to be concerned that this isn't going to stop by itself, right? I, so. I completely agree, and I think that's of the utmost importance. I think that's one of the key things with regard to this guideline. And again, going back to why is this different, this, these guidelines also not only uh, talked about treatment of patients with status epilepticus, but also help redefine how well, we define what status epilepticus is. And I, I totally agree that time is of the essence, and these people need to be treated as, as quickly as possible. And that's, that's helped by our viewers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if 
families of patients with epilepsy should be asking their physicians about what is status epilepticus and how do I recognize if the patient, if, if my family member is having seizures that are too long. Mm -hmm. And what should I do about that? Should I call the ambulance? Are there medications I can administer at home? Those things that I think that, that patient families should be asking their physicians. Right, absolutely. Um, in future broadcasts, we'll likely discuss uh, other things such as rescue medicines, what can we do before the ambulance get there, uh, those sorts of things, and some of those emerging therapies as well. So, uh, Dr. Kramer, thank you for joining us, um, and um, stay tuned for other things in the future. Right. Thank you. Appreciate your help.